why did God do for you what he did for you? And uh, the answer you get is grace. Uh, undeserved, unmerited favor from God. That, and I don't know that I, I don't know if I preach enough on grace or not, but I tell you what, grace is the reason why I'm here, the grace is the reason why you're here, and that grace is amazing because of what God has done uh, with each of us. Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis 19, and uh, this, this may conclude... Um, our study of Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom, as far as the destruction of Sodom is concerned. Um, then we'll move into the issue of Lot and uh, what, what happened with him after Sodom. But I think clearly, clearly what happened with Lot and his daughters uh, was a result of the vexation, I would say, of living in Sodom. Uh, they say when in Rome, do as, do as the Romans do. Um, when you live in Sodom, you tend to think uh, the way the Sodomites think. And um, I think that that had an impact uh, on Lot. Now we know that Lot is in heaven because the Bible refers to him as just Lot, meaning that he had been, he believed God, and so God granted to him justification. And the issue of justification basically means that. As the old preachers used to put it, just as if I'd never sinned is what justification is all about. And that's how the Bible, that's how the New Testament refers to Lot as being just Lot. And so I believe him to be in heaven uh, in spite of his willingness to throw his daughters out to the mob and then uh, himself being drunken enough that he would sleep with his own daughters. But anyway, we'll get to that uh, probably next Sunday night. But let's read uh, in Genesis 19, uh, let's see here, verse 23, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. Um, I want you to hold that place there, and let's go to, I don't have this in my notes, but I, let's go to Revelation, if you would, please. Um, I tell people when I go out preaching, and I'm, and I'm trying to teach people the things that God has taught me over the years on how to read the Bible and what made it so interesting to me uh, that I just I couldn't get enough of it there for a while. I just read it and read it and read it and read it uh, was the idea that I, I started seeing that what I was reading was not just an ancient story that happened years ago that it was over and done with, but I was actually reading a prophecy. I was reading something that was going to happen in the future. It's just like reading, some people read their horoscope every day. Find out what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know if you, I've told this story many times, but I like to tell it every now and then. When I was young, we would get a copy of the paper every day. We had a, we had a daily paper instead of weekly paper here in Jefferson County. And... Um, it would get delivered, and, and I'd come home from school, and I would open up the paper, and I'd look at my horoscope. I'm a Gemini from May, born in May, so I'd look at my horoscope, look for Gemini, and I'd read that, and I would go, oh, ain't that something? That happened today. Oh, my goodness. 
I didn't realize that what I was reading was for the next day. So you can just make it up as you go, I guess, you know. That's how generic it was. But what you're reading in this Bible is you're reading prophecy. So if you look in like Revelation chapter 8, um, verse 7, the first, these are the trumpet judgments. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burned up and all the green grass was burned up. Second angel sounded and, there, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. Third part of the sea became blood. Third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter and then the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten the third part of the moon the third part of the stars so as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise and so you have the in in the first especially the first trumpet you have what looks like what God did to Sodom. It also matches what God did in Egypt, where he rained fire and brimstone down upon Egypt as part of the ten plagues to get Pharaoh to let God's people go, but it, it did not rain fire and brimstone in the land of Goshen where the Jews were. And then if you look in Revelation 18, and I think this, this has a lot to do with this. Um, let's see here. Where do I want to look at? Uh, verse 18 of chapter 18. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? So they see Babylon burning with fire. Uh, and it's a very, 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 um, very hot fire that God destroys Babylon with. Look back in verse um, 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And so clearly... God uses Sodom as, a, as an illustration and as a warning of his judgment when it comes. If God says to all who come after those who lived in Sodom, if you live like this and you maintain your lifestyle this way, and if your city is this way, or your country, back then cities were states, they were ruled over by kings and so on, you had the city-states, and if your, if your nation lives this way, then you can be assured of its fiery destruction. God is going to do with it exactly what he did with Babylon, or excuse me, with Sodom and with Gomorrah and uh, Adma and Zeboam. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Bless those who are with us, Lord, both here and online. And uh, Lord, may we heed the warnings and the judgments of your word. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 7, or chapter 1. Uh, these are different places in the Bible where God is saying, what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah is exactly what I'm going to do to you. In fact, you're no different than Sodom and Gomorrah, or in some cases, you are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. How would God look upon this nation right now as she stands? 
I love America. I do. I love my country. I am a patriot. Uh, and I'm going to vote for Trump again. I'm not going to apologize for that. You, if you think I'm going to vote for Biden, you're nuts. Or, or Kamala. I ain't voting for that either. Uh, but I, am, I love my country. I'm a patriot. I, I, I believe in saluting the flag, honoring your country. We need God back in America. Amen. We need God's righteousness back in America or, or God's going to bring his judgment to America. But if America will not repent, then rest assured, God may give her a space to repent. But if America does not repent, then America is going to receive exactly or worse the judgment that God gave to Sodom and Gomorrah. Look in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. If we knew exactly how much of this country the Communist Chinese Party owned, it'd probably shock us. The state of Missouri passed a bill several years ago that made it um, a lot more difficult for foreign-owned countries to own land, especially farmland, in the state of Missouri. And I'm in favor of that. American farms should be American farms, not Chinese communist farms in America, in Missouri. But that's exactly how it's turning out. Strangers are devouring our nation in our presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. In other words, no one, no one lives there now. And there's nothing but death. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. And remember what Abraham was, was asking God to do. God, if there's 50 people, will you spare it? Yes. If there's 40 people, will you spare it? Yes. If there's 30 people, will you spare it? And so on. And he said, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now, I, I'm, I believe 100% that it's very possible that one of the reasons why God has not destroyed America is for our sake. Those of us who still believe the Bible, those of us who still practice Christian ways, those of us who still honor the word of the Lord and are trying to live right, live, live res, as res, not just responsible Christians, responsible Americans. Honoring our country by living a moral lifestyle. That used to be taught in our schools. A civic res you have a civic responsibility to live a moral life. You have a responsibility not to be a, a taxing on the judicial system and the court system and the prison system. But what's happening now is we got so many people getting in trouble, so many people getting arrested, so many people standing before judges, and because of COVID now, so little space in jails anymore that we can't handle all the people that should go to jail. So practically everybody that gets in trouble hardly ever goes to jail. They get, they get probation, slap on the wrist, that's it, and... And, and do better. But that very seldom ever works. So I do believe that it's possible that God has spared this country simply because there are still some God-fearing people in this land. Verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law, our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And who's he talking to? He's talking to Jerusalem. 
He's talking to Jerusalem. He's talking to his people and calling his own nation Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's saying, if it hadn't been for a remnant of you people, look in, um, turn to Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. We have an illustration of that. When God shows Ezekiel in Ezekiel 8 what's going on inside the, inside the, the temple. When, when God shows Ezekiel what the religious leaders are doing. How they're on the outside it looks like that they're worshiping God. But literally in the temple because no one really was allowed in the temple. Only certain of the elders of the tribe of Levi, they, they were actually, they had pictures and images inside the house of God that they were worshiping and they had their backs turned to the east, had their backs turned away from God. It was just wicked stuff. They, no, they were facing the east and had their backs to the, to the most holy place. They turned their back on God. And so in Ezekiel chapter 9, um, Verse 2, Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, and with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of the Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In mine hearing, Go, after, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, because judgment begins at the house of God first. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. In other words, they went through the, with swords killing everybody except those who had the seal of God. It's a picture of Revelation 7 and the seal of God in their foreheads. God put a mark upon them to show that these were the, these were the remnant. And the reason why he wasn't just wiping out the entire city and killing everybody. When, when they found the tares planted amongst the wheat, the guys said, you want us to go pull it up? No lest you pull the weed up as well. God is not going to destroy the righteous when he destroys the wicked too. Keep that in mind. Listen, quit letting the people on the internet scare you to death. Because they are. They are scaring you to death trying to make you think that they're going to come kill us all. So, and by the way, so what? So what if they come kill us all? So what if they come marching in here right now and kill every one of us? Don't you threaten me with eternal life. I'll call your bluff. Amen. Do what? Yeah, there'll still be a fight, but anyway. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's, that's what he's saying here. Had it not been for a remnant, I would have wiped you out completely. And... I believe there's still a remnant. Now, I don't know who they are. I don't, know, I don't know if they're here in America or in Jerusalem. But there's 144,000 men that God, I believe, has already picked. They may be alive now. I don't know. But he's going to put the seal of God in their foreheads. And they're Jews from all those tribes and God's going to separate them out to be his own people. What I love listen, I love Israel. I know they're wicked, I know they're foul, I know they're they're at the probably at the top of every conspiracy ever. But God loves them. And you better love them too. You know, I wouldn't say anything against them. I know that. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 8. He said, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen. Why? Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. Their tongue. 
their tongue. What did James say about the tongue? It's the most wicked member of our body because of what it does. It speaks things. Words that are spoken can never be taken back. And he said, um, their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. That's all that crowd that's come out of the closet. That's all that crowd that lives that Sodom lifestyle. They're not hiding it. They're now, they're, they're called heroes. They're celebrated. They hide it not. They even have parades now. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. Did you see what God said? To the righteous, don't worry. It shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. And if you get to the point to where you can sin without shame, it's probably too late. I believe a person can get to a point in their secret sins to where they stop being sorry, they stop repenting, and God then will take them if they don't repent and turn them over to a reprobate mind, sear their conscience with a hot iron so that they declare their sin as Sodom and they hide it not. That's when they come out and say, this is who I am and, and uh, this is who God made me to be and all this and that. Um, and I could, I could just tell you stories. I mentioned, I mentioned one this morning about the preacher that I knew. I was always intimidated to be around this preacher because he just, he put on airs to me, or maybe it was just me, but he just put on airs to me that he was a very holy, righteous man. And it was like I wasn't worthy to be in his presence. That's kind of how I felt. And uh, turns out that more than likely, some of the preachers that really know him say that more than likely this was not the first time he had ever had an affair. It had probably been going on secretly for years. But the fact that when he was confronted with his sin, he chose not to repent, but to blame others, like Saul did, to blame everybody else and not repent of his sin, it looks to me like God took his mercy from him like God said he did with Saul. Remember what he said to David? The son that comes out of you, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he, could, if he transgress my law, I will chastise him with the rod and the stripes of men, but my mercy will I not take from him as I did unto Saul. And God took his mercy away from Saul, and it looks to me like God has taken his mercy from this preacher. And, I'm, and I mean, the, imp, the blowback and the impact from what this, how this guy turned out, I mean, it scared me, which I guess is good. Mike, be careful, Mike. Don't make the mistake that he made. Don't turn into him. And all of us preachers need a little bit of humility and a little bit of sobriety about us to where we say to ourselves, don't turn into that. Don't go that direction. Don't do that. I got... 
a preacher to show you here in a little bit. Isaiah 13, turn there. Babylon. And we just read here in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18 about Babylon. And, and Babylon's in. Babylon's going to end up the same way Sodom and Gomorrah ended up. So Sodom and Gomorrah is a foreshadowing of Babylon. It's a typology of what's going to happen to Babylon. When you see Sodom, you're seeing Babylon. So Isaiah 13, verse 19. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Boom. See, it connects it right there for you. And it shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Watch this. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. There's a spiritual, I think there's a spiritual language here. No, there will be no churches here. There will be no churches here. Okay? Is everything all right? Um... The shepherds will not make their fold there. God will remove the true churches from a, from a town, a city, a country, an area. God will remove them from that so that those people will not hear the gospel. When, when Paul wanted to go to Asia, God directed him against it. He said, no, I don't want you to go to Asia. I want you to go west. Preach the gospel that way. Why? I think God knew that for the most part those people would not listen, would not hear. To this day, it is very difficult to establish churches in China, Japan, places like that. South Korea has, hasn't been too bad. There's a, quite a few Christian churches, uh, to my knowledge, in South Korea. But th as far as Asia is concerned, it's very, very difficult to establish a Christian church there. But anyway, God said it would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and the, uh, the shepherds will not be able to have their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. We're talking about spirits now. Because, because of what it has turned into, and the fact that it is not inhabited by the man, and the man in this analogy would be Jesus Christ. Because it would be like, Chris, it would be like if uh, a different spirit came in here on all of us because we're just all out sinning, and we just decide that we are going to change everything, and we're going to set down our King James Bibles and, and go with some other translations so that we can be like the other churches and bring people in and, and, and do what everybody else is doing to, 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 to bring people, to get people in the pews, which is how I thought 20 some odd years ago. It would be like if we did that, we would be dismissing the presence of Jesus Christ in the form of His Word from this place, we would be making a void, a spiritual void in this church. And when this book is gone from this church, spirits will move in. Amen. That right now, they won't come, they will not come in and dwell in this place because it is, it's, it's not, they can't handle it. They can't do it. You know those citrus candles that you light to get rid of mosquitoes and moths and everything? We went camping years ago. Alicia, I don't know if you remember this, down in Branson. We had tents that we set up, and it, they was miserable, so they didn't like that. But I was having fun. But anyway, they had a little, had a little uh, hut there and a light, and it, it just moths everywhere flying around that thing. I mean, we couldn't hardly do anything because there's so many bugs around. Well, we got one of those candles, and we lit it underneath that thing, and I mean, boom, they're gone. It got rid of every one of them. There was something about that smell that they just cannot handle, and they're just gone out of the way. That's what I'm talking about. You get Jesus Christ, the Word of God, in your life, 
And there will not be any satyrs dancing around you. There will not be uh, owls and dragons laying around everywhere, foul spirits and everything like that. There will not be those things there present there because the presence of Jesus Christ is in that place. Somebody say amen. So it, it is, you know, I'll, I'll bring you back to remembrance of, and I have not heard any more about it, but the Free Will Baptist Church in Oklahoma where the pastor had a threesome going with his wife and another man and how his wife and that other man conspired to kill her husband, the pastor of that church and they killed him and the police began to investigate and started finding out all this stuff about all three of them, how they was having threesomes together in hotel rooms and stuff like that. That stuff, listen, I, I went and listened to some of his sermons and sure enough, the man wasn't there. But the dragons obviously were. It is obvious to me that the dragon spirits and the doleful creatures and the owls and the satyrs, they were there. Very, very present. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And I, as, it's like I said, will that church ever be able to recover from that? Unless God sends a man over there with a great big King James Bible and starts preaching right to those people. And I pray that he does. Jeremiah 23, verse 14, I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery. He's talking about the preachers now. The preachers commit adultery. They walk in lies. Several years ago, I made a video called The Emerging Church. And a, a church in this town, I won't mention it, but a church in this town, they had had a, a pastor there who had been there for years and everything, I, I heard him preach before, he was a good, good preacher. And... Um, but when he left, they hired another preacher in, and he immediately was starting changing everything. Um, our choir director, Alicia, uh, was the choir director over there. The pastor called him into his office one day and said, you don't have a job here anymore, you're done. Put him out from being the choir director of the church. The church had a real nice choir and put him out. Why? Because they're going to change the music. We're going to the praise and worship rock and roll band stuff. And several of the, several of the older people in that church did not like what was going on. It was their church and they did not, they said, no, nah, this is not going to happen here. Well, it was happening and all of a sudden these people were coming over here to get somehow, I, well, I gave... Dennis a copy of that DVD emerging church and he must have told some other people about it and one day my vi my um, um, Vice principal came that I went to high school with came over here his wife him and his wife came over here and said We heard you had copies of a DVD about what's going on in our church and I said I sure do and I was just surprised to see him but I gave them a bunch of copies and they passed that thing around and pretty soon they split off and started New Testament Baptist Church, Southern and Traditional. Because they said, we're not going to be part of this. Well, guess what? They found the pastor was skimming money to house his mistress. Yep. 
They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers. In other words, they don't preach on sin. When you don't preach against people's sins, you are strengthening the hands that commit those sins. You are enabling those sins. That none doth return from his wickedness. Nobody repents. Nobody's sorry for anything. We don't want to offend anybody. The all of them unto me is Sodom, and inhabitants thereof is Gomorrah. Now God has said that, and when he says that, judgment's coming. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. What do we read in Revelation 8? God sent a star down called wormwood. I will feed them with wormwood and make them... And by the way, wormwood is absinthe, and it's a hallucinogenic. Makes you see things that aren't there. Makes you believe things that aren't true. It, it's, a, it's a liquor that lies to you. And you believe the lies. And drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me. The Lord has said, ye shall have peace. They say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his heart, no evil shall come upon you. In other words, God will not judge you. God just favors you. He, he loves you. He's not going to do anything bad to you. They will not even, they will not preach hell, they will not speak of hell, they will not warn against hell, they will not talk about sin, they will not warn against sin, they will not preach repentance of sin, they will not do it, they were strengthening the hands of the evildoers. Now, who recognizes this lady up here on the screen? Her name is Gwen Shamblin. She was a um, registered dietitian. Got a master's degree in, in dietitian, and uh, she grew up Church of Christ from the Memphis area. She has a real deep southern accent, and um, she, she wrote a book called The Way Down Diet, where she combined Christianity and prayer with weight loss. Well, the book took off. And she was teaching seminars in churches all over the country. And she made a video and another book. Um, Lisa, I think Lisa had that book. And I remember watching a portion of the video. She said, you only eat when you're hungry. When you feel hungry, you only eat. And then you only eat like eight bites and this, and that, and the other. I don't, I don't care what kind of diet you have. That has no... That's no big deal to me. But over time, what she was doing, she was equating weight loss with salvation. She would say things like, you are listening to Satan when you take that extra bite and not listening to God. You're not honoring God when you take more bites than you should and if you're not losing weight, then you're giving praise to Satan. That's, that's the problem. So, but she's getting rich. And I mean, she's got seminars going. She's got thousands of churches all over the country doing her weight loss program in their church. She's raking in millions of dollars. Now, the picture on the left is her, one of her pictures from the early 90s. The middle picture is her husband... Uh, Mr. Shamblin. Now, he didn't follow her diet. And he did not want her to go in this direction. And there was a lot of controversy in their marriage for years. Until finally, well, what happened was she wrote a statement about the Trinity saying that the, there is no such thing as the, the Trinity, that God is not three in one, and this and that and other. Well, that caused her publisher to drop her. That caused all these thousands of churches to drop her. Eventually, I don't know the whole story, but eventually she divorced this guy and marries Tarzan. The guy on the, the, the picture on the bottom is her new husband, 
and he was Tarzan. There was a TV show back in the 90s. He played Tarzan in a TV show. He was in a few movies that you've never heard of. He's an actor, and he's had so much done to his face, he can't hardly move his face. But he's slim, and he's got money, and so she marries him. She buys property in the Brentwood area of Nashville, which is very rich. It's where all the country stars live. Very wealthy section of Nashville. And starts her own church there. Guess who the pastor is? She is. She names herself pastor of this church. And she's, I mean, it's filled to capacity every Sunday. She's raking, still raking in millions and millions of dollars. She's teaching this gospel of weight loss, that if you're fat, you're not serving God, and if you're not losing weight, you're giving, pray, you're giving uh, praise and power to Satan in your life. And she basically developed her own cult and a works-based gospel that said if you eat more than nine bites, you're serving Satan and you're not saved and this and that and the other. She was in the midst now, and by the way, she's a real short thing, so she had to add eight feet to her hair to make her taller. 66 years old, and she wants to look rich, and she makes videos about her and her husband and how, how they enjoy God's wealth and God's success, and there's happiness and peace in God. And By the way, it's okay to drink in moderation because she has parties at her house all the time that are way over the top, and everybody's got a glass of liquor in their hand. She says in moderation, but I guarantee you they're drunks galore because in May... They flew out of Smyrna. They bought an 80s model jet. They couldn't afford the $45 million Kenneth Copeland jet. So they bought an 80s model jet, gave it a paint job, refurbished the inside of it. And I watched a guy, this is what got me knowing her story, was he does forensic things on YouTube about airplane crashes. And he said, these jets, he said, you can't even get parts for them anymore. And he said, they're, they're just near the end. By the time, this time now, they're near the end of their life expectancy. And, she, and her husband paid money under the table to get certified to be able to fly this jet. And their flight plan took them up to 3,000 feet. And he circled around and they made a 70 degree angle right down into the lake. And not only killed all seven on board, but it literally ripped all their bodies into pieces. She was in the midst of teaching on YouTube about greed and how greed is evil. Um, and there's all kinds of weird things about her I don't have time to get into. She is a perfect example of what we see here. The prophets, they commit adultery, they walk in lies, they strengthen the hands of the evildoers. Doesn't matter what sin they committed, as long as you lose weight, you're showing how godly you are. Doesn't matter how much you drink, if you lose weight, you show how godly you are. And that's that's how her life, and that's that's the, that is the, continuation now of her testimony her testimony throughout our lives will be she lied to the people she lied in the face of God and paid the price for it Jeremiah 49 18 as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof saith the Lord no man shall abide there neither shall a son of man who's the son of man Neither shall a son of man dwell in it. God's telling you, if, if things don't straighten up, I will not be there. Jeremiah 50, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Lamentations 4, 6, for the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. 
that was overthrown as in a moment, and no hand stayed on her. Zephaniah 2.9, Therefore as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Amos 4.11, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a firebrand, firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. God said, I even pulled you out of the fire to save you, but you still haven't turned to me. I always, you know, there's, we hear of people all the time who have a near miss, and they live through it, and our prayer is that maybe God will use that to get a hold of them. Do you remember 9-11? America had an opportunity to repent then. And she didn't. She didn't. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab, I already read, already read that. That's it. That's all I have. But God makes it clear. Those who live as Sodom, those who live as Gomorrah will face the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's one thing, if the world's going to live that way, it's expected. They're lost. It's another thing entirely when supposedly saved people live that way. I believe God has a hotter judgment. So where do you get that, Pastor Mike? Judgment must begin at the house of God. And I do believe God has a a worse judgment for those who say they are saved, say they are born again, pretend to be Christians, yet live that any, any, any kind of sinful, private, secret lifestyle behind everybody's back, yet pretend to be righteous and holy. Be sure your sin will find you out. Can I hear God's people say amen? amen. Let's stand for prayer.